Good morning and welcome to Building Hamilton with Ken Beacon Dam, brought to you by LegalSecondSuites.com on 900 CHML. This is your go-to resource for information about Legal Second Suites, basement apartments, and garden suites. Ken explains what homeowners can and what they can't do and what you should look for when adding a new unit to your home or your property. Ken, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Rick. It's great to be here again and be able to uh, be able to speak with your listeners, uh, to your listeners, just about everything uh, that has everything to do about legal second suites. Mm-hmm. It's a big topic. Housing, uh, right here in Hamilton, housing is, is, a, is a big topic. It's a it's a big concern for many people. Um, you know, we are definitely uh, need more units. Um, there is, uh, you know, there's a lot of crisis is happening in our community around housing. Absolutely. And we got a number of hot topics we're going to get to today, including triplex and fourplex conversions. We're going to talk about waterline upgrades. We'll get into some myth busting. And uh, we'll begin with maybe one of the hottest topics, probably aside from housing prices or maybe rising mortgage rates. One of the hottest topics is renovictions. And maybe to begin, I'll let you explain what a renoviction is. So a renovation is when basically an extensive renovation has to take place to uh, a property, uh, to a building, to a a residential unit. Um, And that is the catalyst for a landlord uh, to apply for an eviction order on on the unit Mm -hmm. so that they can get vacant possession of the unit. Um, And there's in a lot of cases, there can be very valid reasons why a unit has to be vacant, you know, depending on the um, how extensive of, of renovations you need. In other cases, you know, there's um, less of a need for the unit to be vacant, and those renovations could take place with the tenant living there in the property. Um, but this is why it's such a big um, a big topic of concern in our community right now about the validity of some of these renovations um, and some of the ulterior motives that are are behind some of these renovations, mm-hmm. um, which which is a, a serious concern. So at the end of the day, is there a hard and fast rule on what type of renovations would be allowed to displace a tenant? So basically, um, it's a bit gray, and this is why we're, you know, seeing what we're seeing in our neighborhoods right now about this. Um, so basically, any renovation uh, could could be deemed uh, that they need vacant possession if uh, a professional um, in the industry has deemed it so. Okay. Um, and so, if if the um, order is taken to the landlord tenant board and has to be adjud- adjudicated, uh, the adjudicator would be asking for an, a professional opinion on uh, why the unit needs to be vacant. So um, that could be, you know, a licensed uh, designer, uh, an architect, uh, somebody who's you know, certified in the building code, mm-hmm. uh, permits and bylaws to basically help give that opinion. Um, I've been asked before to give my opinion on 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 it uh, as part of an order, um, and in some cases, yeah, like the unit does need to be vacant. Like the whole building is being gutted back to the you know the structural elements right. of the building. All the mechanical systems are being replaced, removed entirely. So, uh, in those instances, yes, like the unit does need to be vacant, and and unfortunately, you know, uh, any occupant that's in the unit has to has to relocate you know so in those instances you know you're referring to a major you know uh renovation right uh, you know a, a gutting or you know you're you're moving walls or you're taking down walls or you're you're installing maybe new flooring whatever the case is in those minor cases quote unquote um is is there any uh, there's got to be some gray area as well otherwise we're probably not going to be talking about this but uh, when it comes to repainting or you know we want to recarpet the unit or or a bunch of units on a floor that's not necessarily going to uh, force a tenant out of the facility. Would it, or, would, or or is that happening? Well, so like what you're what you're getting to is like cosmetic upgrades. Yeah, the minor upgrades. Right? Yeah. New flooring, mm-hmm. maybe um, you know a fresh coat of paint. Uh, you know, maybe some new cabinetry or something. All of those items don't actually require a building permit, um, and those are co- cosmetic upgrades. Right. Um, in order to have a valid um, eviction order. Uh, for renovations, you do require a building permit. So it has to be something that triggers 
a building permit. Okay. Um, and so a lot of that, in, in a lot of those cases, it's going to be something that's more extensive in work. Primarily the mechanical systems, like if we're doing new HVAC, new plumbing, new electrical, um, you know, and unfortunately all of those systems are behind the walls, behind the drywall, yeah. right? So in those cases, yes, you know, we're removing drywall finishes, you know, ceiling assemblies are coming down. Sometimes fire separation assemblies are coming down in order to install those new those new systems. Mm -hmm. So it does have to be something that does require a building permit. Um, you can't just, you know, file for an eviction because you want to put new flooring in the unit, right. right? That's not a valid, that's not a valid reason. And um, obviously people can still remain in that unit and have the flooring replaced as an example, yeah. right? Yeah. Or like if, if the bathroom needs new tile work, right? Because it's cracked tiles or something. Um, that's not a valid reason for uh, to file it an eviction order. Mm -hmm. Are, I know we've been talking about this is a hot topic in the town and it is. Um, are we seeing a lot of it? Is it, is it at a, is it at a dangerous level? Um, it's hard to track because, you know, not, um, not everybody's aware of what current applications are in front of the board for evictions. Um, you know, we are seeing, um, other evidence of it taking place. Um, like, for instance, you know, the increasing demand on our um, shelters, right? Um, increasing encampments, uh, you know, people struggling with, with homelessness or being underhoused. Uh, we're seeing other, um, you know, effects of that happening. Uh, but, but it's hard to say if it's rampant, you know. Um, we, obviously, there's big cases that do make it into the media. Like, for instance, that uh, that one building, 1083 Main Street East, that 60-unit building, um, where they didn't have water for, you know, a whole weeks, bunch of months. Yeah. Weeks, months, yeah. right? Um, so there's cases like that that does make it into the media, and then everybody hears about it. And, um, you know, that particular uh, case obviously was a catalyst for um, this, this renewed discussion about, mm -hmm. about these rent eviction bylaws. Because, look, there's, um, there's bad actors on both side, sides of the aisle. You know, whether, you know, we have bad landlords, but we also have bad tenants as well. And so um, any discussion around, you know, reforms to uh, the Landlord-Tenant Act, um, you know, to any sort of rent eviction bylaws that the municipality might be entertaining, um, it has to be a fair and balanced approach. Um, and has to address the bad apples. There's thousands and thousands of awesome, amazing, wonderful tenants out there who do what, they, uh, what they're supposed to be doing. They're paying their rent on time. They're mm -hmm. not damaging the units. They're taking care of the place. Uh, they're being respectful to other you know, tenants in the building. And same thing with landlords. There's thousands and thousands of wonderful landlords out there who take care of the properties. They take care of their tenants. They treat them with respect. They, they're there making repairs and maintenance. But look, there's people out there not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Right. Um, and this is, and this is causing issues for all the good people out there. Um, and I don't think that we should rush to, um, implementing, you know, new bylaws or, or new, new regulation that would have a more negative impact on the vast majority of people. They should be targeted, um, and they should really get to the root cause. Um, and, you know, a lot of issues that we see happening is does stem around non-payment of rent. This seems to be the number one catalyst for all of these other issues that we're seeing happening, right? Um, you know, when a tenant is not paying rent, you know, and there could be legitimate reasons why they're not able to pay the rent, uh, but nonetheless, you know, rent is not being paid, right? So, a property owner or a landlord starts to get desperate, right? Because, you know, that income is not there anymore to support right. the mortgage, the property taxes, the expenses, right? Um, and because of issues at the landlord-tenant board, uh, because we have a lack of adjudicators, uh, there's, a, there's a big uh, backlog of cases there, you know, uh, we're not seeing justice for tenants and we're not seeing justice for landlords. Um, and so people do what they need to do to take care of themselves, right. right? And this is this is why we see landlords, you know, um, changing the locks on tenants. Um, this is where we see landlords, you know, doing rent evictions that they that aren't valid, right? Um, this is where we see tenants as well, also, you know, taking advantage of 
the backlog at the landlord tenant board, not paying their rent, not just for a few months, but for a year or plus, mm. right? Wow. Which can really put uh, a property owner in a really financially desperate situation. And I think we also need to, to um, you know, separate out the large commercial uh, landlord operators, the big REITs and the, and the big apartment complexes, separate from the small mom and pop um, homeowner landlord. Right. Uh, because the, the, big, the big boys, you know, they can absorb um, more non-payment of rent right. than a smaller landlord. Uh, you got to think like, you know, a smaller landlord, that could be, that could be your, your brother, that could be your parents, mm-hmm. that could be your, your child. Um, and if, if they're not receiving rent coming in, like their lives are in financial jeopardy yeah, they, as well. They have bills to pay too. They have bills to pay as well, right? So, um, so we, we just need a fair and balanced approach to this. And everybody needs to recognize that, you know, right now we seem to be scapegoating the landlord. Um, and at the end of the day, it's really, it's a, it's a, the root cause is really a, a government lack of investment in housing going over decades. Yeah. Um, and if we need to be protesting anybody right now, we should be protesting our governments mm-hmm. to really be investing in housing. Um, and let's not, um, you know, make the everyday landlord look like an EV, uh, evil, greedy person because I know so many landlords, wonderful people, um, you know, really do value their tenants. And um, and I think that story needs to be told more. Yeah. This isn't a, you know, a months long problem or even a years long problem. This is a decades long problem. Governments uh, not investing in affordable housing. And it's really had that huge trickle down or domino effect to the people who are now, you know, facing rent evictions. How do we turn the tide here? I know you want to focus on these targeted bad actors on both sides. I- is there a fixable solution in the not too distant future? Well, so... This is what's great about legal second suites is that it um, we can in a relatively short period of time implement a lot of new housing units. Um, you know, to get any sort of subdivision approved or a larger condo tower can take years and years and years to go through the the bureaucratic red tape yeah. uh, in this province to get housing built, right? Um, whereas a legal second suite really could be um, implemented in a matter of months. Um, and we're utilizing our existing housing stock, our existing infrastructure. Uh, we're making really good use of our tax dollars by just adding more units within our existing housing stock. Um, and we can do that, we can do that rapidly. Mm -hmm. Um, so one thing that, uh, you know, our governments could consider is incentivizing homeowners and incentivizing, um, families to create these units in their existing homes by giving them some form of a subsidy or a grant towards it. Uh, but it ha- but the grant has to be sizable enough that it actually makes financial sense. Right. Um, some of the grants that are available right now, uh, you know, Hamilton has a grant, for instance, and, and I know St. Catharines has a grant. But some of these grants, they if you actually, you know, sit down and go through the numbers, uh, you look at the, the qualifications to get those grants, they just don't make any sense on any level. Mm. And this is why we see, like, basically zero uptake on these grants. Um, so those definitely have to be, be taken a, a, you know, a second look at. But, um, but adding, adding a unit into your home uh, just makes financial sense on so many different levels. Um, and it's, it's well proven out there that you know, a single family home uh, with a legal secondary dwelling unit that has income generating, uh, it's an income generating suite, um, that that asset, that house is worth more. It's worth more in the marketplace. Um, and why is it worth more? Well, because because it's an income producing uh, unit, uh, people can qualify easier for that purchase. When somebody can qualify easier for, for a purchase, um, there's going to be more demand for that. There's going to be more people out there looking at that, that property because now they can qualify for it easier, right? Um, and so we see a lot of first-time home buyers really wanting uh, uh, to have those units in there, you know, whether they're buying a house already turnkey that has a legal suite in it or looking at a house that an, uh, one can be added. Mm-hmm. They're, they're definitely looking at it. And so um, we, just, we see that in comps. We see, we, we, you know, we see that in sales. Um, you could have two houses side by side. One is just a straight single family. The other one's a single family with a, with a legal second suite. That one with the second suite is going to sell for more. It will. 
Like it's, is there is there a I'm sure there's not a hard and fast dollar amount on how much more that home is worth, but generally speaking, are we talking tens of thousands more or ten thousand more? What what is the dollar figure on how much more that that house with the legal second suite is compared to the general single family home? Well, so um, if you look at it from a mortgage qualifying perspective, um, like every ten thousand dollars in in um, income. Uh, could get you $100,000 on a mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so just from a mortgage perspective, um, the fact that that income is coming in, it could be worth $100,000 more, right. 100%, wow. just, just because of the qualifying. When it comes to, and you mentioned, you know, you you can do what you do in months, whereas, you know, a developer of a, uh, of a suburb or a subdivision is going to take years to do. And that is a win-win because not only are you putting money into the pockets of those who own the home, but also those who need a place to stay, uh, they can get a legal second suite. You know you're going to be safe. You know you're going to be in a comfortable setting. Uh, probably a, a pretty good neighborhood, I would understand. This is a huge win-win. It is. It is. It's, a, it's a huge win. Um, you know, so many of our neighborhoods are actually underpopulated, um, right? There's the, like a lot of our uh, inner city schools are suffering from low enrollment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not every, not every um, school district, but there are many school districts that are, that are looking at closing their, the school because there's not enough population in that area, right? Um, and so adding these units into these existing neighborhoods, it's, it's only going to be helping um, all of the existing infrastructure that's there, right? right? The schools, the com community centers, the libraries, uh, the local businesses that are there. Right, just having more people uh, in the neighborhood, it's going to help everybody. Right? Um, look, it's a contentious uh, issue. Don't get me wrong. Not everybody believes in, you know, secondary dwelling units. Um, a lot of people have this misconception about rental units, mm. uh, rental properties, about tenants. Um, look, like you could be a tenant, he could be a tenant, I could be a tenant, everybody could be a tenant. We're not bad people. Right, um, our aunt and uncle, our son and daughter, may be a tenant. Our parents may be a tenant. Right. They're not terrible people, right? But there is this misconception out there uh, with existing homeowners and existing neighborhoods that when they see a rental property being developed, you know, uh, they they get all like, you know, they, they get crazy, mm -hmm. you know. And we we <laughs> see it, you know, with our minor variance applications and any sort of development work that happens in an existing neighborhood and people find out it's going to be a rental property, you know, you know, they, uh, they freak out. Right. Um, and a lot of that is just a misunderstanding, a, you know, misconception about what it is that we're creating. Right. Uh, we're creating legal, safe, beautiful dwellings for great people. Um, and they're at a price point where it is more attainable than let's say a straight single family home. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of people right now, they can't rent a single family home 100% on their own. Uh, it's just, it's too much. They can barely afford to rent half the home, like a basement apartment. Yeah. Um, so it, it is, you know, it's part of solving the missing middle about creating more of other types of housing units that are um, attainable to more and more different types of people, mm -hmm. right? We need more of that missing middle housing. Uh, and this is what's great about legal secondary dwelling units, coach houses, garden suites, you know, small infill development work, um, you know, and, and again, it's within our existing neighborhoods, using our existing infrastructure uh, and, and, and can be re implemented relatively quick. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, uh, we're doing some myth busting, to be honest, with uh, Building Hamilton with Ken Beacon Dam, brought to you by LegalSecondSuites.com. And you mentioned the, you know, the misconceptions. There's a, there's a home in a neighborhood that's being renovated, the basement, you're turning it into a legal second suite, a win-win for the homeowner and the, the, the would-be tenant. What is the misconception or the mindset of those other people on the street thinking, well, there goes the neighborhood. I mean, here comes a rental property and we're all pooched. Well, no, hundred percent. Like we had it last year up on uh, Hamilton Mountain. It was in the it was in the media, it's in the, it in the newspaper uh, about a garage conversion. Mm -hmm. One of the very first garage conversions that happened on, on the East Mountain, uh, and we did need to apply for minor variance at the time 
for a reduction in parking. Um, Hamilton has since removed their parking bylaws. You know, I think, you know, in light of this case uh, that did get a lot of media attention, a lot of neighbors came out opposing it. Um, but, uh, but the concerns of the neighbors there was that, yeah, we were destroying the neighborhood <laughs> by adding another unit right. into the neighborhood. Um, and that is just going to be another absentee landlord not taking care of the property, you know, getting, you know, shoddy tenants in there who are going to leave garbage everywhere and, and stuff like that. And like, that's so far from the truth. Uh, it's such a misconception. It's, it's a myth. Like, it's complete bull, yeah. you know. Um, and, you know, again... Like, it's all about bad actors, okay, on both sides of the aisle. Yes, there are bad landlords out there who don't take care of their properties, 100%. There's also bad tenants out there who leave garbage everywhere. We see it all up and down, you know, parts of this city, right? Um, but, uh, but those problems can be solved with good targeted um, requirements and good enforcement, too. Um, but there's also thousands and thousands of amazing landlords who take very good care of their properties who are their properties are actually neater than homeowners on the street <laughs> and we see that too in certain parts of the city oh, i believe it where you know once an investor has bought a property they fix it up 100 percent. they invest hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. fixing up a property they clean up the yard they resod it they build new fences um, and then actual homeowners down the street do nothing with their property, yeah. right? So it, it's, you know, there's both sides to this to this story. Absolutely. You mentioned the missing middle. Um, how big is that? Well, the missing middle is huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, if you actually look across our, um, our province, you look across the GTA, you know, especially in, in the Toronto area, they have this whole yellow belt region, they call it, uh, which is all this low density, low housing density mm -hmm. um, you know, areas. Uh, we have it here in Hamilton too. Um, and this yellow, these yellow belt, belt areas, these low density residential areas, like there's so much space there actually for, for increased density, um, you know, for small low rise buildings, like three story, four story, right. um, you know, for tri, triplexes, four plexes, um, you know, uh, townhouses, you know, all of these kind of like these kind of medium density uh, housing developments, you know, um, and, you know, not everybody wants to live in a condo tower. Not everybody wants to live in a single family home. Not, not everybody wants to live out in the country on a farm. Mm -hmm. um, I live on a farm, actually. I, I love it. <laughs> I love living on a farm. Yeah. I couldn't imagine living in, in town myself, but... Um, but still, we need this missing middle type of housing, um, these small, these smaller apartments in single family homes, uh, like the basement apartment. Um, you know, we need these small townhouses, street towns, that type of development, because that's a it's it's a housing type um, that is is there for for the middle, for the middle class, right? right? Uh, the missing middle, um, and it's it's. It's just lacking out there. We have big condo towers. We have fields of single family homes, but we don't have this medium density development, yeah. which we, we need a lot more of. You mentioned the yellow belt. I know the, the green belt has been a hot topic in this province because the, the provincial government opened up certain sections of the green belts to, to build more homes. Could that potentially solve this missing middle or at least kind of, you know, f fill it in a little bit? Well, yes, that's a big topic. It's, um, we need to grow both up and out, unfortunately. Um, you know, as long as our federal government is, you know, mandating huge immigration numbers here, which just drives population. Um, again, the vast majority of new people coming to this country and to this province are landing right here in the GTA. Mm -hmm. um, and we are landlocked. We have Lake Ontario on one side. We have the escarpment on the other side. You know, we have the green belt that surrounds us. Um, and everybody wants to live where the people are, right here in the heart of the GTA, right? So, um, so on one hand, yes, we, we have a lack of land, um, you know, for housing. This is why we need to be pushing infill development work, increasing density in our existing built up areas. Yep. But at the same time, we also need to be building out, you know, um, and, uh, yes, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, 
it's a tough topic to talk about politically. Um, you know, there there are cases where adjustments can and should be made to the green belt um, for proper development. Um, you know, obviously we we're not we don't want to be paving over our wetlands. We don't want to be you know cutting down our forests and, right. and all of that kind of stuff. But there are places that have been designated green belt that really shouldn't have been. Um, and obviously the province is trying to make adjustments to that. I get it. It's political. Um, I'm I'm more of an advocate for for building up than building out mm -hmm. uh, because I see all the opportunity around. Um, you know, in my line of work, like we're always assessing land parcels, looking for the highest and best use for property. You know, how many units can we add onto this onto this land parcel? And there is tremendous opportunity, um, but it's you know NIMBYism is strong, yeah, it is. right? NIMBYism yeah. is powerful. Uh, it stops development in its tracks. And, you know, unless we do something to curb the nimbyism, um, it's going to be very hard to build up. Like, we get pushed back trying to do a basement apartment, you know? <laughs> yeah. Imagine trying to build a townhouse complex or a medium density or like a, a you know, 20, 30 unit tower. Um, we see the uproar happening in, in, our, in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? You can't build out into the green belt without protests on the street, but you can't build a, 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 a condo, condo tower, an apartment building, or a townhouse complex without a protest on the street. Yeah. So, um, like, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Like, we need, we need housing. You know, people are crying that it's not affordable anymore. Um, it stems from a lack of investment over decades, which we know. Um, but uh, this is where I'm a big believer in secondary dwelling units. Um, I think it's a low-hanging fruit. Um, we can build them rapidly and fast. I know our firm, we've done well over 600 just in the last, you know, three, four, five years here. Hmm. Um, and that's powerful. That's powerful. That is huge. And, uh, yeah, that, that goes a long way to uh, providing affordable housing for individuals and, uh, again, uh, being a financial windfall for the homeowner as well. I do want to ask you one more question regarding, as we're doing this myth busting on, on green belts and affordable homes and building up as opposed to out, the concern is, and we're still going to get to water lines and, and triplex and fourplexes, the concern of the green belt is, you know, we've heard the term McMansions, right? These developers are going to come in and won't build affordable housing or won't build multi-unit housing structures. Do you get the sense that a lot of people are right in that regard, or do you think developers are going to say, listen, we need this diversification in the housing that we have to build? Um, no, I don't think people, I think people are right. I think um, if it was left up to the developer, um, they would build more single family homes. Why? Right. Because they can make more off yeah. single family homes, right? Um, so I think, I think 100%, I think if the province is going to open up, or they, or they have, parts of the green belt for development, it should be minimum medium density housing. Um, you know, or a certain percentage um, has to be medium density right. or even high. Well, high density housing should be located more in the, within the urban boundary already in our downtowns and, and you know, close to transit, 100%. Mm -hmm. but, um, but for these new subdivisions going in, it has to be medium density. Uh, I would say higher percentage medium density than 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 low density. Um, look, we still need new single family homes to be built. Look, like I said, not everybody wants to live in a condo apartment. Yeah. Not everybody wants to live in a basement apartment. Um, we still have that, you know, uh, North American dream of single family home with our white picket fence mm -hmm. on our own plot of land, yeah. right? And you can't stop people from, you know, pursuing that dream. But we have to give people options. Right. And I think, um, you know, as as a province and, and, and as our you know, municipalities here, you know, we can implement density targets uh, for these new lands that, that, that are opening up for sure. Excellent. Uh, let's travel over to water line upgrades. Uh, what do you want the people to know about this? Yeah, so this is um, an item that can catch people off guard when they're looking at adding a legal unit to their home, um, is the need for a properly sized water service line coming into the property. Um, most new homes that are being developed now have a, the, uh, you know, under the building code for a single family home with the standard number of fixture units or your plumbing fixtures mm -hmm. um, is a three quarter inch copper water service. Um, we see in many of the 
existing homes, the older homes, you know, homes that are built in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, they would have what we call now a substandard water service. So they might have a, could be half inch lead, could be half inch copper, could be five eighths lead or copper service Mm -hmm. line. So a service line that's undersized uh, compared to what current code would would require. And so when we're adding a new legal second dwelling unit, obviously we're adding another bathroom, we're adding another kitchen, right. uh, we're adding another laundry machine, um, you know, dishwashers, whatever, right? So our fixture count goes up in the building. And so we need to make sure that we have the proper water service line. So um, so under the, under the, uh, the building code, um, you know, we're allowed up to, if we go up to 31 fixture units, um, which in a lot of cases, when we're doing a, a secondary dwelling, we are getting up to that upper limit mm-hmm. of, you know, anywhere from, you know, 20, 25, you know, 27 fixture units, um, we have to upgrade the water service. And so uh, most people um, that we're helping, we're upgrading to a one inch water line. Okay. If you have a a typical single family home, let's say a bungalow, Hamilton Mountain Bungalow as a good example. Mm-hmm. You know, we have two kitchens, two bathrooms, um, two dishwashers, two laundry machines, okay? That would require a one inch water line upgrade. Um, if we did that same house, but we took out the dishwashers, so no dishwashers in the units, we could we could have a three quarter inch water service. And mm-hmm. so there's some cases where we come across and people have an existing three quarter inch line and they you no, know, they don't want to spend four or five grand upgrading the water service to one inch, and so we just we just don't uh, put the dishwashers onto the right. plants. But um, but what the uh, what people should know is that you know if they do want to do a water line upgrade or maybe they have existing half inch lead uh, or half inch copper and they're maybe struggling with low water pressure mm-hmm. uh, in their in their house or building, um, if they email check for lead at hamilton.ca, um, and if they send a picture of their water service. So where that where that water line comes out of the concrete floor in the basement, right. you take a picture of that uh, and you send it in to check for lead at hamilton.ca. They'll tell you, they'll confirm for you uh, the type of service line it is. And then, um, and then they'll direct you to Hamilton Water to uh, pay for a permit to upgrade that water service. Um, and there are grant programs here in the city if you have lead, okay, if you have a, a old lead Waterline, there's there's grants available uh, for people to upgrade it. Great to hear. One more website to mention again? Uh, check, check for, for lead, lead at hamilton.ca. Triplex and fourplex conversions. What are some of the differences and some of the pros and cons of doing this? Yeah, so as you know, as uh, Bill 23 has allowed, um, we're allowed up to three units under Bill 23 right here in Hamilton, actually. Hamilton is very you know, progressive when it comes to their zoning bylaws for housing, which mm-hmm. is great to see. Um, and even before Bill 23 was implemented, the city of Hamilton was already allowing four unit conversions. Wow. Um, so in certain certain zones, okay. Um, and so we could potentially have, you know, uh, four dwelling units within uh, an existing home right here in Hamilton. Um, in some cases, you know, we could do three units in the principal home and then do a, a fourth unit in like a, a coach house or a laneway suite, right, okay. a detached unit. Um, and so we're getting, uh, you know, increasingly we're doing more and more triplex and fourplex conversions, uh, especially in the lower city. Uh, we have these old century homes, these two and a half story century homes. Um, many, many of them we're, you know, we're already, you know, illegal triplexes or illegal fourplexes. You know, the city is littered with thousands and thousands of illegal units. Okay, um, but now because you know Hamilton has come around and made it easier, you know, we're going back through and and trying to help everybody, you know, legalize these illegal tries and enforce. Uh, but what people need to understand is that uh, under the building code, there's a big difference between what's defined as a house which is up to two units, Mm -hmm. okay? And what's defined as a building, which is three or more units. Okay. Um, And there's some key differences that people need to be aware of. Uh, The biggest one being ceiling height, okay? Ceiling height is always our number one thing that we check. Like uh, outside of zoning, the next thing that we check is is ceiling height. Mm -hmm. So for a house, okay, in Hamilton here, because Hamilton is, is following national building code for ceiling heights in houses, 
four secondary dwelling units. They're allowing 77 inches finished for the main ceiling height, okay, uh, and 73 inches underneath the bulkhead. So this is for all your all your two unit conversions, all the okay. bungalows, basement apartments. 77 inches for the main height, 73 inches underneath that bulkhead in the basement. Uh, but once we become a triplex. Uh, so now we're three or more units. We're considered a building. So um, Hamilton is not following national code for buildings. They're sticking with Ontario building code for buildings. Mm. And so for the basement ceiling height, we have to be 83 inches finished mm -hmm. for the main ceiling height and 77 inches underneath that bulkhead. So we're higher. Um, and so this, is a, this can be a, an issue for people where they have an illegal triplex um, or an illegal fourplex, it's maybe only recognized as a single family home. Now you have to take it through a building permit process to legalize it, but they're deficient on their basement ceiling height because um, we have to be 83 inches. And right. especially in the lower city, we have these older homes, these older century homes, they all have low ceiling heights. Um, and so this is where you really have to double check that because um, you know solving a ceiling height issue is going to be a more expensive renovation. Right. It's not impossible. It's feasible, um, but it could be expensive because now you have to basically dig out the basement, maybe do bench footings, maybe yeah. do underpinning. Um, it can get much more costly. So uh, definitely a big thing for people to be aware of. Um, this is stuff that we check when we're uh, working with uh, homeowners and property owners uh, as part of our checklist that we that we go through uh, with people. Um, we actually have a checklist on our website, uh, legalsecondsuites.com slash checklist. Uh, people can kind of download an easy to follow guide nice. for when they're kind of just assessing, you know, high level assessing their property, whether or not it's going to be feasible. Um, and then the other big thing with triplex and fourplex conversions is our means of egress. So means of egress is the way that you enter and exit uh, the building or the way you enter and exit the dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. um, and under the building code, when we have a shared entrance, so a lot of these, you know, these uh, tries and fours, we have shared entrances with another dwelling unit. So you come in the front door, maybe you go upstairs to a unit and you go through the, the front door to the main floor unit. Um, under the building code, we require a secondary exit door. Um, and so this is where, you know, in some cases we need fire escapes in rear, um, you know, deck step systems uh, to provide that secondary exit. And this can also get much more costly for people sure. uh, if they need if they need uh, to implement you know a fire escape for instance. Um, so those are the, the uh, two key things: is our is our increased ceiling height and our secondary exit requirements. Um, and so happy to talk with anybody who's looking at doing a triplex. Maybe you have uh, a property you own in the city that's uh, an illegal triplex or illegal four. Um, maybe you're living in one of these uh, types of <laughs> and houses. have no idea and have no idea. Um, no, definitely feel free to reach out and we can, uh, you know, give some guidance on, on what we can do. You can check out uh, that checklist online, legalsecondsuites.com. And you can also go online to the website, get more out of your home by booking a free consultation and getting Ken and his team to look at uh, your property and give you some options and a go forward plan. Ken, great show as always. So we'll uh, catch up with you in the next month. And uh, you have been listening to Building Hamilton with Ken Beacon Dam. It's brought to you by legalsecondsuites.com on 900 CHML.